Welcome to Get Started Investing. In this podcast, we cover all the basics that you need to start your investing journey. Are you joining us for the very first time? Is this the very start of your investing journey? Well, before you dive into this episode with us, our feed is designed to go from the very beginning. So we strongly recommend that you scroll up and start at episode one. Here at Get Started Investing, we unpack all of the jargon and the confusing bits. We hear your investing stories with the goal of making investing less intimidating. And of course, we want to have a good time along the way. My name is Brian. Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. I'm excited for this episode. There in Australia, we've been waiting for a certain type of product for a long time. Yes. Years, in fact. Yes. Cryptocurrency ETFs. And they finally arrived Yes, with the help of some friends over in Switzerland. <laughs> yes. And we've got one such friend all the way from Switzerland joining us today to talk about it. That's it. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome Hani Rashwan to the studio. Hani, Welcome. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. So, Hani is the co-founder and CEO of 21 Shares. They're a Switzerland-based issuer of cryptocurrency exchange-traded products, and they're committed to making cryptocurrency investing more accessible to all investors. This episode has been sponsored by ETF Securities in celebration of the launch of Australia's first spot Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. They're both, both listed on uh, CBO, CBOE. Uh, the tickers EBTC is the Bitcoin ETF and EETH is the Ethereum ETF. And it's new here in Australia and we're going to unpack it all. It is. And before we even get into it, we should say because it's listed on CBOE rather than the ASX, doesn't really make a difference for most investors. You still search for it the same way in your brokerage account yep. and you still buy it and sell it the same way. So uh, don't be put off by the different acronym. Um, That's it. But look, Hanny, uh, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, we want to start for people who maybe not may not be super familiar with cryptocurrency. We want to do a quick fire explainer game where we give you a term and you define it and explain it in 30 seconds or less. Uh, you ready to play? Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Well, let's start broad. Cryptocurrency. Um. We prefer the term crypto assets because some of the uh, crypto assets are currencies uh, like the physically backed USD or euro or whatever. Some look more like commodities, um, but cryptocurrencies in general carry uh, thousands of uh, crypto assets out there, uh, most of which uh, are uninvestable, uh, but a lot of which will be the future. I think one um, famous VC from Sequoia said, 95% of this seems like crap, but the future will lie in the remaining 5%. <laughs> and we, uh, of the, I, I think of the more than 10,000, we sort of have 35 products or so. And that's illustrative of, of the, uh, the quality in the top assets. Mm. Nice. Well, the challenge is going to be finding those 5%. That's for sure. Yeah. So uh, 30 seconds or less, uh, Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is a form of digital gold. Uh, it is non-sovereign. It has actual limited supply as opposed to just a scarcity element to it. Uh, and it's also a, um, the first representation of, of a blockchain, which allows people to interact with each other without a centralized uh, counterparty. Um, as a technological system, it has been up and running since uh, about 2010, 2009 with no downtime whatsoever. And so compared to Google, Apple, Facebook, Bitcoin has been up more uh, with <laughs> less issues. Wow. And uh, when Bryce and I were early days at university, one of our friends bought some Bitcoin, made $10 and sold it and has kicked himself ever since. <laughs> but if, uh, Bitcoin, <laughs> if Bitcoin was the first uh, representation, uh, we've seen a number since. And probably the second most famous is Ethereum. So uh, 30 seconds or less, what is Ethereum? Well, first, to make your friend with Bitcoin feel better, the first time I got Bitcoin was $15 per. Oh, and no. uh, I threw it away because it was, there was nothing but to do with it back then. <laughs> um, Ethereum is the, uh, is the second biggest um, crypto asset. Um, Bitcoin's about $600 billion, Ethereum's about $200 billion, uh, And it's a way for you to build applications on top of the blockchain. So you can sort of think about it like an app store um, concept with the underlying infrastructure um, and people have done all sorts of payments and trusts and uh, gaming and, and a whole slew of other industries on it. So when people think about 
uh, developing on the blockchain, when people talk about the metaverse or NFTs or, or things like that, that's a smart contract platform. And Ethereum happens to be the biggest uh, player in that space. Mm. Sort of an apples and oranges comparison with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it's part of why the catch-all of cryptocurrencies sometimes is not the greatest way of talking about it. Mm. So the two ETFs that have been launched are at the Australia's first spot, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. So uh, t- a term that's, I guess, relevant here is spot markets. What, what's going on there? I think the easiest way of explaining this is that you can buy the um, assets, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, directly, physically, where you actually buy it, or you can buy it indirectly in some way. The indirect access includes usually more complexity. So you're buying futures or contracts or options or uh, you know some other uh, convoluted setup. Spot is just a very easy way of saying when you, when you buy gold or when you buy Bitcoin, you're actually going and purchasing actual gold or actual Bitcoins, mm. which um, our ETPs track spot. And so our ETPs and ETFs around the world are a way of buying physically backed uh, crypto assets. Mm. And then uh, a second term that's relevant when we talk about these ETFs, cold storage. Can you uh, help us understand that? Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, all of the crypto assets are uh, stored somewhere, usually on a computer. And the storage is quite important because people want to make sure that, uh, you know, their assets can't be stolen and, and can't be hacked, can't be uh, maybe through a mistake uh, thrown away or something like that. And so cold storage, as opposed to hot uh, custody, um, is basically a computer that has never connected to the Internet and doesn't have the right hardware to connect to the internet. So at a very basic level, imagine if you had a laptop but took the network driver out. Um, And then that way, that computer never actually has the ability to connect to a network where your assets are stolen Mm. uh, or can be moved from one to another. Uh, We do all sorts of things on the back end for security um, and employ cold storage in the vast, vast majority of cases, and aside from just the creating new shares, redeeming all sold shares, uh, everything should be in cold stories uh, with the qualified independent custodians that we use. And that's just an additional way of securing crypto assets. Hmm. So, Hani, there's been plenty of talk of a spot crypto ETF here in Australia for a couple of years now. Uh, the major exchange here still hasn't moved on it, um, and that's hence why these are listed on the SIBO. Uh, can you talk us through the process of, of getting these listed here in Australia and uh, yeah, what, what, what was that like? So it was a years long journey, uh, believe it or not. Um, if you can't tell from my voice, I'm not really Swiss. I only live here. Uh, <laughs> we took a look at uh, 27 different jurisdictions around the world, including Switzerland and including Australia. So we've actually been working on this from the very, 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 very beginning. Um, And Australia had a lot of uh, history with the company because we also contemplated uh, doing some crazy things like buying an empty mining shell and loading it up with Bitcoin and (laughs) and, uh, listing it and and all sorts of uniquely Australian product constructs. Um, Regulatory concerns and priorities differ from geography to geography. Uh, And... While it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about the specifics on on how Australia was different, um, obviously it is different from other geographies. It takes some time uh, for regulators to properly understand and and feel um, comfortable about it. Um, And sometimes it takes longer than we want. Sometimes it surprises us. But overall, um, we've we've addressed the regulatory concerns over the past year and a half. and the Australian regulators have been some of the much, 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 much better ones that we've dealt with. We've, we've had no qualms with them whatsoever. It was just about getting across the, the finish line. <laughs> I was just going to say, if Australia has been one of the better regulator- regulators to deal with, we won't ask you who the worst has been. I don't, I don't share that <laughs> list. I only, I, only, <laughs> um, I only share the list of, of the, um, the uh, good types. But... Um, with respect to the exchanges, we had prior history with SIBO. Um, 
can't talk about it in, in great detail, but, but there is public information out there that our uh, Bitcoin ETF application in America uh, that we're doing in partnership with, with Kathy Wood and ARC is also with SIBO. Um, and so there was very good history there. Uh, we were interested in, in, in an exchange that was both crypto native and able to move quickly. And we found a good partner there. Uh, we're not negating the possibility of potentially also listing on the ASX and working with them in some capacity in the future. Um, and we have a few uh, such um, parallel experiences. So in Germany, for example, we're not just on Deutsche Börse, but we're also on, I want to say, six or seven other exchanges. And so this, wow. uh, this is very much part and parcel of what we do. We want to... Um, make the entire crypto asset class highly accessible. And that involves uh, being available wherever investors and consumers are at the end. Mm. Look, uh, I'll, I'll call out the ASX. I won't make you, Hanny, but uh, the ASX for years has been involved in a project to implement bo- blockchain technology in their business. Like they look at blockchain and they see the value of it for uh, exchange. So, I can't. I, I'm a little bit surprised they're not more willing to embrace, you know, products like yours. But hey, we will see. Um, but we I, actually have not had too much work or discussions with the ASX because SIBO was just a, a, a very good relationship already. So we we haven't entered into some of this stuff. But I would I would differentiate crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum from some of the enterprise blockchain, mm. big corporate uh, kind of. Um, movements that we've seen in the last couple of years. And obviously that has not been going well um, for anyone involved in that space. Yeah. So I think, Hani, when we talk about a cryptocurrency or a crypto asset ETF, the obvious question that emerges is, why do we need an ETF to access a digital currency or a digital asset that can already be bought and sold online? So I'm sure you've been asked that question before, but um, why, why crypto ETFs? It's a great question. So there are a number of reasons to do that. Um, let me start at the very, very beginning. We have, we've built the world's largest crypto ETF issuer. We also have a tokens issuer where you can buy some of our baskets and indexes in an Ethereum token form. And our point here is that all we're doing is building bridges into the crypto world. And so whether an ETF or an ETP um, or an ERC-20 Ethereum token or a Solana program token is the most appropriate vehicle for the end investor to do that, there will be a product with our name on it that will give you that capability. On the spot perspective, so if you think about just a Delta One tracker of Bitcoin, something that tracks Bitcoin one-to-one, depending on where you live, this might be easier to buy through an ETF or ETP. Um, It might be more tax advantageous to buy through an ETF and ETP. And then for certain investors, especially on the institutional side, sometimes they, oftentimes, they have mandates that preclude them from investing in non-securities. And so if you wanted to buy this and, and you were running an investment fund, chances are you could buy our products and get access to Bitcoin directly, one-to-one. Um, and you would, it would be impossible for you to do the same with physical Bitcoin. Uh, at the very beginning of the company, my co-founder and I actually built this because our mothers were looking for <laughs> ways of, of purchasing Bitcoin. And um, it says something that my mother has a degree in computer science, but this was frankly easier for her, um, not dealing with custody, not dealing with transfers, not dealing with anything. And everything that I've said so far applies really directly to the Bitcoin ETF or the Ethereum ETF or the single asset tracking ETFs. When you get into indexes, well, of course, an ETF or, uh, you know, a product makes a lot more sense. Anyone can, you know, figure out the top 500 companies in America and then spend all of their lives trying to rebalance it and and constantly deal with it. There's a reason why we buy the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And so for those index products for, um, in Europe and in other geographies, and we're working on bringing them uh, around the world as soon as we possibly can. We have a short Bitcoin ETP, as an example, for you to take inverse exposure. Uh, We're going to launch more of those. We have the world's largest um, index, and we have the world's largest product suite of indexes and baskets so that you can take thematic themes. 
We have a bunch of income generating products. We just launched one that pays 5% interest on USD. And we've launched um, for years now, uh, staking ETPs that generate some yield off of the underlying assets. For those, all of the things that I said still apply. Sometimes it's better tax from a tax perspective. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's simpler. Sometimes you don't want to deal with custody. But on top of that, the increased complexity is something that oftentimes individuals cannot do by themselves. Mm. And that's where we come in and give you an easy product. So, Hani, for those sitting there listening to this and thinking about, you know, this might be a, an opportunity to get access to Ethereum and Bitcoin that haven't taken the leap into uh buying directly, do the prices of these ETFs move with the, the cryptocurrency? Are there any nuances? No nuances whatsoever because the products are designed um, for us to purchase the equivalent amount of Bitcoins and store them. Uh, everything is physically backed. It's physically backed by 100%. Uh, there are no premiums or discounts and, and we purposely pick products um, that are um, amenable to that. And so we don't have any product structures built on futures, for example, which will have contango effect and um, it, it doesn't track the asset. Uh, specifically, we don't have any trusts or ETNs with counterparty risks or premiums or discounts. $10,000 worth of uh, our shares will equal $10,000 worth of Bitcoins minus our fees. And that is it. Honey, before the break, we were talking about the two new ETFs that 21 Shares and ETF Securities have partnered to launch in Australia, uh, the Bitcoin ETF EBTC and the Ethereum ETF EETH. Now, um, we when we were doing the quick explainer game at the start, we mentioned cold storage and it would be good to just expand on that a little bit more and understand the security uh, of the crypto assets in these ETFs because I think... When people think about cryptocurrency, uh, these days their minds probably go to some of the hacks that have happened over the years, some of the some of the losses that have happened. Um, so I guess uh, help us understand the security around here, and um, you know, what, what what would you tell someone who's who's got those questions and is sort of new and unfamiliar with this crypto space? So when we first started, we wanted to make sure that people. Um, feel safe and comfortable in these products. And one of the things that really came to mind is that ultimately when you're buying the products, as cool and sexy as our company may be, you're not looking for exposure to our company. You're looking for exposure to whatever assets you're buying. Um, and so to use the Bitcoin ETF as an easy example, you're just looking for exposure to Bitcoin. You're not looking to take counterparty risk um, or you know, be exposed to our operations. Uh, as a result, we have picked um, regulated, audited, insured third-party custodians to keep an arm's length away from us as an issuer and to make sure that we're not involved in this, to give additional comfort, but to do it in an audited, regulated manner. And so we work with a little bit more than half a dozen um, custodians, and they're spread around the world, some in America, uh, some in Europe, um, and we'll add more soon in Asia. And basically what we look for are regulated counterparties so that we can ensure that in some cases they're regulated as trust companies or custodians or something like that with the legal protections that that entails. Um, in addition, we take a look at audits uh, of ensuring on a, a daily basis that, that everything is, is smooth sailing um, and that there are no problems. And we typically look at insurance as well in case anything catastrophic happens so that we can guarantee that the assets uh, that the investors are purchasing are safe and are kept with reliable counterparties that exercise um, prudent and conservative handling of these assets. And that's where um, a lot of things come into place. Uh, keys being split up and, and, and distributed geographically. Um, keys not you know, being controlled by one uh, centralized party at all times, uh, insurance being um, on top of that, assets being held in cold storage, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, Hani, we'd love to get your views uh, a bit more broadly on the crypto market itself. We're speaking in a particularly tough moment for crypto, a uh, bit of a, a winter at the moment as, as the uh, 
as the hardcores say, crypto winter. Um, uh, my portfolio is obviously uh, being hammered as well. How are you thinking about the crypto markets at the moment? I personally couldn't be more excited about the crypto market at the moment. I think <laughs> I'm that hoping you'd say the, that. <laughs> the amount, yeah, I think the amount. No, I've, I've drank all the Kool Aid, Bryce. Don't you worry. Um, if you look at the fundamentals of the market, more people um, are involved. Uh, better uh, overall talents are, are are coming into the field. Better institutions, larger institutions, and. In the vast majority of cases, the systems are not only up and running, but they're, they're thriving and they're growing. Um, if you take a look at Bitcoin, I think it is miraculous. We don't talk about this enough. It has, ha it has had less downtime than Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, Amazon combined in the last 12 years. For something that is distributed, that is not handled by one company, um, it's absurd. It's doing exactly as it says it will do. It is beautifully designed and it and it works seamlessly um there are a lot of um interesting shifts that are happening so part of this is the technological shift and and what we're seeing across the board both with sort of new forms of tech that we cannot contemplate so think about when the phone first started um no one thought about the app store and zynga poker uh, or, you know, clash of clans or whatever. But that's sort of where we are with crypto. We're sort of in the 1993, 1994 uh, time period where we clearly are very hopeful, but no one would have accurately predicted just how big and important it would be later. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, that's part of it. But in addition to the technological shift, you also have a um, technological shift in a greater focus globally on, say, privacy. And in a lot of cases, we are tired of being, uh, you know, hacked with our account information and, and all of my private information being out there. People are thinking more about encryption. People are thinking more about how to um, safeguard their, their, their personal information. Um, and crypto is going to be an immense helpful aid here, both from a monetary perspective where, you know, you can safeguard assets and things like that in the same way that gold has over centuries. But also, um, there are really interesting things that are happening on the identity side, where you're able to shield your identity from the other counterparty. Because if, if a blockchain is just enabling you to have transactions without trusted intermediaries, well, if you go to um, a lender or someone that needs to know who you are just to verify that you're not a criminal or on this list or on that list, they technically don't need to know exactly who you are and store that information. And there are all sorts of very interesting things that are happening there. You couple all of this with a generational shift. You couple all of this with the fact that Bitcoin is far superior than gold in every way, except that it's less shiny. Um, <laughs> and you get all of these interesting inflection points that are happening at the same time that should propel this forward. Um, whether year to date has been good or not, is irrelevant to what should be a 5, 10, 15 year journey that will touch every facet of our society and certainly every inch of our um, financial systems. Yeah, well, on that point about uh, the emerging use cases for crypto and where we're seeing it impact different parts of our society, it would be great if we could um, delve into that a little bit more and uh, maybe if there's a few emerging use cases that you think are particularly exciting or perhaps particularly relevant, um, it would be great to talk about because Bryce and I often talk that the conversation around crypto begins and ends with the price and we feel it kind of lets the broader conversation and the broader, I guess, technological opportunity or revolution or disruption or whatever you want to call it, uh, it kind of misses the broader point when all we do is talk about the price. So, are there a couple of emerging use cases that you can talk about that really will give us an idea of how impactful this technology could be? Yeah, I think th I think that's a really interesting question. Um, price is interesting because I'm pretty sure in the last 10 years, this is the best performing asset yeah. of, of any kind. Oh, by, um, by a long way, I imagine. By a huge margin. But even if you take two years um, ago, Assets like Ethereum and Solana have outperformed 
the traditional markets. Mm. Uh, I think the issue is less price oriented and much more about short termism. Like essentially, what this is is a long term in, uh, investment. Um, there are as long as you're able to and and willing to hold it for two, three, four, five years, this should be fine. And and you'll end up um, more often than not. Um, being a part of this and, and getting pretty good gains. The people that are trading it and trying to surf the waves are the ones that are uh, not doing as well. But for a lot of people, and especially in the space, and one of the comforting things is looking at the amount of Bitcoin that hasn't moved in a year or more, because you can track that publicly because the wallets are public, um, very, very, very high. Um, and you sort of see the hodlers or the long-term holders in the space really benefit from that. And and that that tends to be I think the correct way of looking at price. If you're looking at use cases, um, sometimes we are blinded by our own experiences. And so um, lower income nations see the value of Bitcoin as a means of transacting. That is a fact. Um, In surveys done, um, including in places like China, where it is actually banned, a majority of Chinese would, about 55% would buy Bitcoin to purchase goods and services, according to polls. Uh, About 50% of Vietnam, Nigeria, India, South Africa would feel the same way. And there's a direct relationship between, a very close relationship between inflation rates and attitudes towards Bitcoin as protection from it. Um, It tends to be very good in Argentina, in Nigeria, in India, et cetera. And those are polls that are, you know, many months old. Um, we're now experiencing 8 and 10% inflation in North America and the EU. We're, we're experiencing 20% inflation in parts of the EU. And so this is, at, at a very, very basic level, um, Bitcoin has performed better than the market, and especially in this turbulent uh, last um, period. There was an um, initial period where everyone was freaking out, and it was completely risk-off for everything except cash. But since then, actually, Bitcoin has outperformed the market significantly. Um, and that is, that is a very, very comforting sign to see across there. And that is just using Bitcoin as digital gold, non-sovereign store of value, lack of money printing, uh, deflationary, etc. cetera. Um, we haven't even talked about all of the cool tech products, services that are being built on top of smart uh, contracts. Um, and these platforms that, that power them like Ethereum. And on those ends, it's also going pretty well. Um, we've seen that with NFTs. We've seen that with some gaming. Um, and we've seen that with a lot of enterprise cases that are only going to increase um, in quantity and breadth and depth over the coming years. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we probably don't have time to get into it now, but the if people listening want their minds blown, the whole idea of uh, play to earn games uh, is just something that I still can't really get my head around. This idea that you get paid to play these games it proves That's every it. <laughs> proves every parent wrong when they said, you know, you'll never get a job playing video games. Uh, watch well, me now. Watch me now. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I can. I, I, I'll come back and talk to you about that. We can talk about that for for hours. But that's that's a great use case of you know from zero to tens of billions in values. Uh, these NFT gaming and these play to earn gaming um, all of a sudden built on Ethereum. Um, and that's something that is part of the crypto world, but but is so new and so large. And so by itself, it's its own thing. Hmm. Um, and that's very, very exciting as well. So, Hani, um, <laughs> you mentioned there that you feel like we're sort of in the 93, 94 stage of the the internet boom. And, uh, and you've also just said that there's... Uh, so much sort of unknown about the the different possibilities that crypto has in the future. Um, And we've had plenty of guests on that have all given their view of where crypto is going to play an important role and and, uh, where the future lies. So to close out the interview, what are some, uh, I guess, areas that you think crypto is, uh, what are some of the future possibilities of crypto, I think, or that you think are most likely to occur over the next sort of decade or so? I think at a minimum, Bitcoin should eclipse gold. Um, It it is far superior. Um, It's it's an analog as gold, digital as Bitcoin. It makes sense that there's going to be a shift. 
Um, what, there are clear numbers that are associated with that. What's the uh, what's the current state of that? Like you said, Bitcoin is about six hundred billion market cap. How how much does it have to grow, or how much does gold have to shrink for that flip to happen? <laughs> um, I think gold fluctuates between seven and ten trillion. Um, wow. Oh wow! Okay, wow. okay. So there's a bit to go so still. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's still a bit to go. Um, we remain excited. I think from a price perspective, eclipsing gold is. 300 to 500 K, um, oh, within that okay. region. Yeah. And so that, that's another way of thinking about it. Okay. Um, I think it, it, Ethereum and the other assets are going to, um, absolutely change every part of the financial system as we know it. Um, that may or may not be apparent to the end consumer. So a lot of it may be in the invisible infrastructural layer, but you'll be able to start seeing things like, um, instantaneous wires for, uh, the fact that the stock exchanges closed more hours of the week than it is open does not make sense. Um, the f- that, you know, you're in Australia, I'm in Switzerland. Um, just figuring out when our banks can speak to each other is, is actually a ridiculous exercise because we're speaking to each other right now. I can send you a WhatsApp message right now. I should be able to also send you, if, if need be, $100,000 right now. Um, and those are some of the things um, or if you're an institution, $100 million. Um, and those are the kinds of things that are going to uh, permeate across the, across the world from crypto. I think we're going to see a ton of interesting uh, use cases, though, that no one in their wildest imaginations could potentially predict. Which, again, if you think about 93, there's no way you would have figured out Uber and, and Airbnb, mm. let alone play to earn let alone AI, let alone all of these things um, (laughs) as well. And so um, the future is very bright. I just think that people should have a very long-term perspective on this. The stupidest thing to do would have been to invest in Amazon for three years. And that is going to be the same thing across the top quality crypto assets. Mm. Well, yeah, and so Amazon is a good example because it's it's seen drawdowns of ninety yeah, percent. Right? Yeah, 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 if not a little more. Yeah. If only we were investing at that time. I know. Uh, I still remember when it was like eight hundred bucks or something. Well, you still have access to Bitcoin and Ethereum today, guys. So that's the, <laughs> true. You, know, true. <laughs> you can make up for the past exercises. <laughs> Yeah, well, no doubt. Look, it's a uh, it's a very exciting space and one that we're trying to get our heads around and and just search for those opportunities you mentioned at the top there. Ninety five percent could be junk, but those those remaining five percent um, could could really be some uh, incredible opportunities. So, thank you so much for your time today, Hani. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure, and uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and sharing uh, your thoughts on particularly the future of the crypto market. Pretty exciting. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, and just a reminder that if you would, uh, firstly, thank you to ETF Securities for sponsoring the episode in celebration of the launch of the f- Australia's first spot Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs, both listed on the CBOE CBO. Uh, a reminder, the tickers EBTC is the ETFS 21 shares Bitcoin ETF and EETH is the 21 shares Ethereum ETF. So as Ren said at the top, you can search them in your broker. Nothing is different from that point of view. Uh, and also check out the uh, webpage to make sure that the product is right for you. We'll include an, a link in our show notes. Uh, but yeah, Ren, always uh, a pleasure to chat and we'll pick it up next week. Sounds good.